morning and welcome to Black Sheep Wolves on a rainy Saturday in October. We've got a very special guest with us today. We've got Betsan Corkill, the author of this book, Knit for Health and Wellness. Um, a book which came to our attention about six months ago, um, which details the benefits of something that we all love to do nearly every day, which is knitting. Good morning, Betsan. Good morning. Welcome. So can you give us a bit of background to the book and more importantly to Stitch Links as well? Well, I set up Stitch Links in 2005 because I thought it was important for people to have uh, information from um, accurate information from a trustworthy source. Um, and uh, I, my background is as a physiotherapist, but I gave up physiotherapy in 2002 because I became really frustrated at not being able to give my patients the time and treatment I felt they needed. And Mrs Smith wasn't getting out of her chair because she had no reason to get out of her chair. Many of the patients I visited were completely demotivated by the system they found themselves in and they had no social contract, no reason to actually get going. So I felt we needed to take a step back with, the, with these patients. They needed social contract, they needed to develop an aspiration in improving mm -hmm. their well-being. Um, and they needed uh, to, to get an interest in the world again. So I gave up my career as a physiotherapist and became a freelance production editor for a range of camera, <laughs> camera and computer magazines and then ended up on a range of craft magazines where I was put in charge of the letters pages. And reading the letters was my light bulb moment, really, because about 98% of them, I would say, were talking about using knitting as therapy. Right. So I was, I had sort of a clinician's head, my clinician head switched on straight away again <laughs> and I sort of wondered why these people are making these claims. And the most significant thing was that there were large numbers of people from all over the world, different backgrounds, yes. different cultures, saying exactly the same thing. So that was, you know, that was really significant. So the magazines made it known that I was interested in actually researching that further. Right. Um, so, and it was from around the world, they started sending me their stories. It was at that stage that I realised I'd stumbled, literally stumbled across something yes. really important, really exciting, something that could change the way we all view our well-being, but also the way that we treat and manage medical conditions. Okay. Um, and I approached the pain clinic at the Royal United Hospital in Bath and asked them if they'd be interested in setting up a social knitting group to test out my theories. And to my surprise, they said yes. <laughs> then I had a major panic because I realised I had to learn to knit. <laughs> and had you knitted before? Uh, yes, my mother told me when I was seven that it hadn't, and I knitted a little bit when I was expecting our children, but nothing on a regular or major um, right. side, no. And what, what is it about knitting? Why, why is it specifically knitting that has these benefits? Well, you, as you can see from the equation behind us, um, Knitting involves patterns of movement and hand position. Then you have the enriched environment which you get from your knitting on yeah. your own. And then you can choose whether or not to join um, a social knitting group. Plus, of course, it's highly portable and the portability of it is really important when we're developing healthcare too because right. that gives people portable power in their hands that they can use anytime, anywhere. And, that, and that's the you, know, you can use yeah. it in bed, you can use it from a wheelchair, you can use it on the bus. Um, so that really um, makes knitting different from a lot of other crafts. Um, but to get the, the um, most benefit, I would advise knitting on your own and knitting and right. combining the two. These elements here make knitting different and they involve patterns of movement. They're bilateral, they're rhythmic and they're cross-body. Right. Um, and those can have an influence on, on the brain, which change the brain um, in certain ways. But also the hand position increases personal space. It provides uh, a lot of knitters, a lot of the narratives I've collected say that it gives them an increased sense of safety. So it enables socialisation and it enables people to go out so people don't feel afraid using public right. transport yes. because they can use this as a self-soothing tool to manage those um, emotions and also manage the emotions of attending a group because we all know the benefits of attending um, supportive groups yes. but for many people actually going to a group is terrifying it's not easy at all and actually even for the most confident of us it's not easy to go to a group for the first time 
So the actual movements, the rhythmic movements of knitting can give people a self-soothing tool. Um, but we also know that if you're doing a, a bilateral coordinated pattern of movements that crosses the midline of the body, right. particularly if you're also looking at it, it takes up a lot of brain capacity. Um, and in, our brains have a limited amount of ca capacity. So if you're taking up a lot of that capacity in an absorbing task, you have less left to pay attention to any problems you're mulling over right, okay. or any alarm signals that are coming up from the body that may potentially be constructed as, as pain, for example, right. by the brain. So um, it's a very effective distractant, but also what many knitters are saying is that it gives the mind a break, gives yeah. the mind a mini <laughs> break, it's like escaping into a sanctuary required mind. We all need to do that on a regular basis because it's really, really important to manage stress on a regular basis. So it can be used as a tool for everyone to improve their health and well-being, but then taking a step further to help people manage the symptoms of um, ill health. It's incredible because you're talking about so many things that I know I do and I know I get from it as a knitter, yeah. but something that I've never probably heard verbalised before. Yeah, that, and that's, that's actually what makes yeah. it so difficult to research, yes. because all these issues here are very important in their own right for um, improving well-being. But they also, and each one of these is a really big uh, research topic, yeah. but they also all interact really closely, and if you, if you research just one of these issues, mm -hmm. if you just, for example, research knitting in a group, you miss the important interaction of knitting uh, at home, linked to that group um, and you might miss then a really important bit of the jigsaw. Right. Because our work is showing that if you knit at home on your own with the anticipation of going to a group, it changes the way you think <laughs> at home because it, it, it encourages you to think forward and encourages you to anticipate, anticipate the praise you'll get when you go to a group, uh, it raises mood. So it could change your home environment and your, and your, and your thinking as well. So of course. Um, it's, that's, uh, so the, the interactions between all these and, and the movements are involved in that um, make it quite difficult to, to research. Yeah. Why knitting and not necessarily crochet? What's the well, the difference we think is in, in the movements. Right. And I think you can, you can, I would encourage people to crochet, I would encourage yes. people to do as many activities and skills, learning skills as, as they can. But I actually tend to teach knitting first, and, and then um, we teach crochet, so right. that people develop a more two-handed technique when they right, yes. crochet. So you can, develop, you can develop your technique so that it's more bilateral. So is there a particular way of knitting that is more beneficial? Well, I if our theories are right about yes. movements and about the cross-body movements, then the bigger your movements, Right. Potentially, the bigger the ben the be the bigger the benefits in respect to the movements yes. there. Um, so, uh, a technique where the yarn is thrown across may be more beneficial than, say, continental knitting. That's good because I can't knit continental anyway. I really struggle with it. It's a, lot. Yeah. It's a good reason not to learn. <laughs> but even so, continental knitting and crochet will still have the rhythm and yes. still have this enriched environment and still have the engagement there. You may not have so much of a distraction with, you know, with the, the cross body yes. aspect of it. The other thing we found with crochet is that you may have to pace it a little bit more than you do with knitting. Right. Because the combination of that grip with the turning can give some people hand pain. Yes. Um, yeah. And so when we're using it as a clinical tool, I have a lot of people who come to my pain clinic group who already have hand pain. Right. So, so you've got, a little, got to be a little bit more careful with crochet. Um, but on the other side, some people can crochet and can crochet for long periods without any problem. So it's a question of giving it a go, really, and, um, and doing a variety of things. It's really important it's, to yes, do a variety. Is there that we should be knitting that, that would have a better benefit? Um, well, I, 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 say, I say in the book that it's actually a good idea, when I found patients, a good idea to have a range of, to of projects. Because according, according to your mood on the day, Yes. Um, 
and it's good to have a project that you just take to a group that's easy for you that you don't have to concentrate on too much so you, you can enjoy the benefits of a group um, and for example a more difficult project will put you into a different mind state from an easy project um, you're more likely to go into a different type of meditative state right a more difficult project is more distracting Right, yes. Um, and of course, what's difficult for some people is easy for other people, so that's again down to the individual. So if you want to distract yourself from problems or symptoms of pain, for example, right. uh, you might choose a, a more difficult project. Okay. On the other hand, if you want to just purely relax, a nice easy project you don't have to think about. If you're feeling low, um, uh, a small project that you finish quickly, you get quick results at, quick fix. Yes, it's got bright colours, so yeah. yeah, you know, that improves. You get the the um, blast of the colour as well, yeah. the stimulation of the colour. So the colours make it colour makes a difference as well. Yes, it does. And but we found that texture is twice as significant as colour right. for affecting mood, and that the ta the, the tactile response um, often translates into an emotional response. So if you're touching something that feels good, it makes you feel good. Yes. Yeah. So texture first, then colour. But the, obviously the ideal combination is beautiful texture in your favourite colours. <laughs> <laughs> are there a particular type of needles, etc., we should be using that are better for us? Uh, personal preference, whatever you find most comfortable. Um, people with hand pain or a tendency to have hand pain tend to prefer wooden needles. Um, bamboo needles can have a little bit too much friction for people with hand pain, so I would, okay. so we use polished birch yes. needles with people with hand pain. Mm -hmm. Often circular needles are better because they don't have the weight of the project of the needles in their hands. Yes. They can yeah. rest that in their in their laps. Um, and also when you when you think about the texture element of you know something that feels good to you mm -hmm. will improve your mood. So if you know, would, if wooden needles feel better to you, then that's better for you. If metal needles feel better, it's it get it's you know it's a question of what you, what you prefer. And is posture important? The way that we sit while we do it. Yeah, if you think about it, if you're sitting for long periods of time, then the way you sit is is important. It's the same as you know the it's very important to sit at your computer. So if you're sitting at a computer looking for patterns for a long period of yes. time, you're sitting. It is important to sit. It's properly, but the most important thing is actually to remember the posture is dynamic and to keep moving. Right. The most detrimental thing is to actually be in one position for more than about 20 minutes. After about 20 minutes, you should move, you should get up, whatever you're doing. Right. Um, because sitting is, is highly detrimental to health for long periods of time. So uh, everybody needs to get up, walk around and stretch, stretch your hands. And make sure you're getting enough oxygen to your okay. vital organs yeah. and, and, and brain. So yes, I would say the most important thing is to move on a regular basis. Okay. I mean, it's, it's an absolutely fascinating subject, and one that I know we'll be talking about much more later on today as well. We've got at various drop-ins today. Um, but I, think I almost feel validated that I'm not just sat wasting my time knitting, I'm getting all these benefits as well. well. Actually, one professor told me knitting gives people permission to sit and do nothing. <laughs> and it's important, <laughs> it's important, whereas you are doing something. Yes. But, but it's important to actually give your brain that break and permission to do nothing every day. I like that. <laughs> okay. Thank you ever so much for coming in today. Uh, we can't recommend this book highly enough. Um, Nick for Health and Wellness by Betsy Corker.